Because sometimes if you do like an affirmation, maybe it's real, maybe I buy into me, but I, right, you know, but I can fake it. I don't have to fake about being grateful about being on fire. That is pretty damn real all the time. I'm almost always grateful. I'm grateful I'm not being attacked by sharks. That's my favorite one. Right, almost all. Um, and um, and uh, Jeffrey Ewan, who's my acupuncture teacher, he spends a day a week being grateful. Thanks for uh, thanks for joining me today on uh, on this chat and. Um, I wanted us to explore a little bit the uh, um, p- perhaps looking at the psycho-emotional energy from a, from a um, sort of overall societal perspective, um, and and then looking at it through the lens of, of classical Chinese medicine, and then maybe even exploring perhaps some of the um, pathologies or, or experiences, again, through the lens of, of CCM, where they, those might occur on, on a more individual level as well. I, I don't know if uh, certain, certain Luo's perhaps might be more active at, at, at this moment or, you know, so yes, yeah, so I just want to ex- explore some of these themes with you. Wh- what do you see going on right now with, with a global pandemic uh, if we were to take a CCM lens to it? So it seems to be my guess is you would probably have to break it down into multiple layers. So my first thought would be is, is that you probably have to look at it as a um, kind of a national level, meaning that uh, the way an American might respond, very generally speaking, might be very different than say uh, somebody in Belize may respond to it. So there's going to be a, because we're dealing with laws, we're talking about um, intellectual, cultural things that are learned. So, so, so first is, is what would be the national response be? And then you would probably have to look at the, the, the microcosmic response or the uh, almost the idea of a township, right? Because a city, even even a city or a neighborhood, might be another way to look at that. So, um, I have a friend in Long Island. And he already knows two people who've already passed from coronavirus, right? They weren't his friends, but they were, um, he knew their names. He knew, he knew them, right? Yeah. And uh, this has acquaintances. And so uh, his response might be very different from mine because I think New Mexico has 31 deaths so far in this whole thing. And that's for a whole state, kind of a ghost, don't really see it. So, so this level of significance within the neighborhood might be different. And then you're going to probably also see that within the individual, they're going to have a habituated way of responding. So the, the individual is going to respond often in a much more habituated way. So is this, is this threat going to be any different than, say, uh, a bad car accident to them? or does the length of time affect it? So, so I think you'd have to look at it as those three variables and break it down because I think those would be the three major things to, to break that down. Why don't we start with, um, I mean, not necessarily the, the, yeah, I mean the neighborhood level or, or state or town. Well, I, to even take a step, maybe in a little bit different direction is, I think you would have to look at the level, so the more significant something is perceived to be, the greater the threat. Hmm. So, if I spill a tablespoon of water on my tile floor in New Mexico, it has no significance to me whatsoever. <laughs> Now, if I throw, put a gallon of motor oil on my new rug, that's gonna be a bigger significant. So, so the perceived level of threat is going to be that. So I would argue, first of all, that the perceived threat in some of these uh, epicenters is going to be much higher than in others. I, I, 
you know, I'd be surprised if you look at something in like Montana that's so rural that I would expect to be very little significance from them. So now the problem when we start talking about lows is that we begin to lose that threshold of significance. So, uh, so lows are the body's mechanism to buy time to handle uh, what's perceived as a crisis. And so they're considered good and appropriate at times. So, the, so, so as a basic introduction to lows, is, is I would say that they are a, um, much like a junk, a junk drawer in the kitchen. So in my kitchen, I have a junk drawer. And in my junk drawer, I have a screwdriver. Now, if I wanted to be fully responsible for that screwdriver, I'd pick it up and put it in the garage. Right. But I wasn't fully responsible because it's in the junk drawer. Now, there could be a lot of reasons. Maybe I was on my way to the garage, the kids came in with some sort of crisis and I never made it. Uh, maybe I think I'm, my time's really important. It takes five screwdrivers to be worth my time to go to the garage. Maybe the garage is a little spooky and I don't want to go out there. Or maybe it's January and it's midnight. I don't, it's cold. But for whatever reason, the screwdriver isn't where it belongs and it's in the junk drawer. And what we do as human beings is we have these same junk drawers, but they're going to be for ideas, for emotions, for experiences, for conclusions that we've made, but we don't really know what to do with them. And so we don't let them go because they might have value to us. We don't really know. Maybe I can hold on to it. So what I do is I put it in this emotional junk drawer. And that's what we call the lows. And each meridian has their own separate um, emotional slash intellectual way of being with each one. So on some level to treat, the, to, to treat the lows, you have to understand the ramifications and what they feel like. So I have all this stuff going on. Um, so, uh, you know, you've asked me to do this, this, this talk. Well, I don't know, maybe, maybe he likes, maybe he doesn't like it. Maybe I'm talking too much. You know, so I have this constant feedback. And so when, and on some levels, that's good, right? I mean, we don't want to be wasting each other's time. So a little bit of feedback's good to make sure we're traveling at the right pace and so on and so forth. So that's, that's good. The, the um, but sometimes the feedback can become pathological and lows become pathological when you lose the choice. So for example, if I need you to constantly tell me I'm a good person, Hmm. that I have broken the feedback loop. So, so what I'm saying here is, is I'm shutting the, the, using the small testing to completely shut off the feedback loop so I can intellectually do what needs to be done. Um, so, and there's times when we have to do that, times of crisis, that we have to do that because the emotions of the activity are overwhelming to the point where we can't take action. And so we may need to shut off the emotions to be able to take or shut off the feedback so we can take action. And so we're using the junk draw, drawer of that loop or that feedback system to, to grab the kids, get out of the house. No, so what we're doing is we're putting the, mm. oh my God, I could die. Mm. Oh my God, my kids could die. Oh my God boy, I can't breathe, this is really scary. We're taking all those experiences, all those emotions, and we're putting them in the junk drawer because we don't want to deal with them right now, because we can't deal with them right now. So the junk drawer is really just a storage shed that hopefully buys us time that we can later go back and go through the storage set and keep what's valuable and what keeps what's not. Just culturally, we don't slow down enough to be able to do that, um, which is very interesting because I think on some levels, that's what this pan-academic is allowing certain, certain populations to do. 
Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that's why I think some people are more comfortable with this than others. Meaning those that have the ability to sort of slow down and, and go through that junk drawer or right. or those that are comfortable going through a, through a right. junk, both maybe. Yeah, and the, the, um, you know, uh, culturally we have removed our distractions, Yep. right? We can't get together for a sporting event. I can't talk about, you know, what happened in hockey last night because it didn't happen. So I don't have that distraction. Mm-hmm. Um, we don't, we can't uh, come together in the church communities. Mm-hmm. And so on some levels we're being left to kind of uh, do this within our small families if we have them or by ourselves. And, and I think it's for some people, it's, an, you know, it's, it's a cleaning house. You know, nobody who wants to clean up the junk drawer, probably not most, but once you do, most people feel a little bit of a sense of relief. Um, so in some ways, it's, it's, it's giving us the, at least the opportunity to do that. And if we heed the call or not, that's, that's a personal choice. That's super interesting. Um, because on, on the one hand, we're being called to, you know, to, to sort of put away overwhelming experiences in order to, to function. And at the same time, yeah, it's interesting that this, this particular uh, period of time is allowing us to, or giving us that opportunity for some um, mm-hmm. to slow down and, and go through that junk drawer. So I'm curious, as one goes through this, by themselves or in a family group what are what are some things that that can come up or or like challenges of of trying to go through that well again i i would argue that's probably a very individual uh process Mm -hmm. um you know there's you know more than a dozen lows each person has uh, has historically in their lives probably used multiple drawers, meaning we have our favorite drawers we like to use. Hmm. Um, we have faith in those drawers. Um, and so, uh, I, and I think it's one of those things that, because um, on some levels where we're really, really kind of boiling i can't it's hard so so this is this is my experience which isn't universal and uh but i really think we're beginning to boil down to our own personal powerlessness as a human being and on some levels all these things are wonderful distractions from how powerless i am um I like to think I'm smart and can make good business choices and become wealthy. Well, the governor told me I can't work. Um, I like to think, you know, that I can do this. Well, I can't. You know, I like to think that I can go to the movies whenever I want. No, nope. even if I wanted to, and I, you know, there's nobody there, you know. I have to make my own popcorn, um, you know. So, so on some levels, I'm really just kind of stuck in my my own space, my own being, with a, a great deal of powerlessness. And I think that powerlessness, on some levels, uh, you you can argue a lot of the lows come from a sense of powerlessness. And so. So I think what it's doing is giving us a, a chance to feel uh, to feel some of that discomfort of of the having our illusion of power being uh, kind of ripped from us. Um, you know, I I think there's ex- a very, for me a very strong sense of being thwarted. I had mm. plans, mm-hmm. I can't do them. 
well, that's fine. I'll create a new plan. I'm flexible, right? Well, oh, the new plan I can't do. You know, so there's this constant like, hmm. And, and I think um, for me that that probably would be that these were the illusions I really hung on to and I'm being confronted by them. So I don't know how universal that is though. Yeah. I mean, yeah, that's, that's, that seems so spot on with anyone trying to run a small business or start a small right. business. <laughs> yep. I have these certain beliefs about myself and that I can make smart, smart financial decisions. Uh, and then we receive these, uh, right. These orders that are out of our, uh, immediate control. Right. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm curious to, yeah, no, I, I agree. I, it's tremendously individual, but at the same time, I think, you know, I think you've, you often have really good um, prompts or um, even specific little exercises that, that someone can do or that patients can do when, uh, when they're confronted with that sense of powerlessness or, or sense of overwhelm, or uh, you, you, you also said like a sense of being like, um, what is it like you, 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 you try one thing and you know, you're like, all right, I'm a flexible por person and then, and I can adapt and you get, and you get that um, avenue cut off as well. So what does, what can one, are there, are there some tools that someone can, can use at this, um, at this juncture to, uh, to try to make sense of that and, and, and move through those uh, emotions in a, in a useful, constructive way? Well, I, I think there, there's, 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 yeah. The, you know, I, I think this uh, being powerless is a human condition that humans have not liked for probably from day one. <laughs> I think we can say that. Um, right. You know, and I think there's many tools, many different spiritual practices, many different parts of the world have, have accumulated these things. Um, so, some of the the ones that I find uh to to be useful and i i know some people um kind of knock it as being kind of a cliche but i i i think that they missed the point but i think attitude of gratitude is profoundly profoundly uh uh powerful um and, and what i like about attitude of gratitude is you don't have to you don't have to move into the dogma of being good being nice being right to start to to use it meaning i can say at least i'm not a jerk like that guy i am so grateful i am not that moron over there <laughs> and and then many many thought systems that would be a criticism of the other person that'd be ego that'd be all this and on some levels attitude of gratitude says we don't care still works and and attitude of gratitude has a way to start to make the bitter experience somehow a little bit sweeter it changes the momentumness of the bitterness to somehow becoming a little bit sweeter and i think spending uh some time consciously cultivating that sense of gratitude and and i think it, i think there's always something we can be grateful for and i am right now grateful that i'm not on fire yes. i'm almost always grateful that i'm not on fire <laughs> right i mean and i i can and because sometimes if you do like an affirmation maybe it's real maybe i buy into it but yeah. i Right, you know, but I could fake it. I don't have to fake about being grateful about being on fire. That is pretty damn real all the time. I'm almost always grateful. I'm grateful I'm not being attacked by sharks. That's my favorite one. Right, almost right. always. Um, and um, and uh, Jeffrey Ewan, who's my acupuncture teacher, he spends a day a week being grateful for all the every experience he has. Huh. 
And I, I figure if someone like him, who I find to be very high level, spends that much energy into it, it's going to be, I think there's a lot, of, lot to there. And again, it's simple, right? Like, you know, I'm grateful that I got a house. I'm grateful that I got this. I'm grateful that I, I don't have a toothache. You know, I'm grateful that whatever. There's always something we can be grateful for, right? But then accidentally, somehow the bigger things start to come in too, all right? I'm grateful my kids are okay. And these, you know, and these seem to have more sweetness than saying I, I'm not that moron. <laughs> and, but, but, it, but sometimes you can't get there first. So you can start with the little things. You can build some momentum. And then all of a sudden you're like, man, this is pretty good. And, and somehow that's the, it turns the bitterness to sweetness. Um, so, so I think that that is pretty useful. Um, the, the one that I, that I do that um, I think a lot of people may be uncomfortable with is I simply try to sit in the uncomfortability Mm -hmm. and see if I could make the uncomfortability be like an old friend. Hmm. Um, this is actually more of a Buddhist type thing because once mm -hmm. you're comfortable with the uncomfortability, you're free. And so uh, uh, there's a lot of unknowns. There's a lot of limbo going on in my life right now, like many others. And, and I don't think humans do well with limbo. And mm -hmm. limbo is pretty uncomfortable. So if I can get comfortable with that, then I'm pretty free. So sometimes I just sit there and just feel it, whatever it is, without judging it, without saying it should be stronger, it should be less, it should be more. Um, and, and, and so there's, the, and, the, and on some levels, that's just really, I'm saying being present to the moment, right? Those feelings aren't gonna kill me. They're not going to uh, have really any effect in my life, uh, you know. So, so I can just sit down and feel them, and 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 I think that would just be a, a, an awareness or being a presence exercise. Uh, there's, you know, there's there's different things that resonate with different people, and if there's, um, you know, if there's some actionable steps that uh, someone listening might be able to take, I think I think those are wonderful. I, it's it's so accessible and like you said it doesn't require that you um <laughs> that, that you get very precious about it um for, for the gratitude part for example you know you just start exactly where you're at and you know and if it, there's a there's a hint of of uh you know unkind or whatever whatever else you want to call it that's fine that's like your access point the the, the starting point to it and it can evolve from that and it's just such a such i agree i mean it's such a powerful uh, emotion or a certain energetic to to cultivate and 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 from there it tends to it tends to generate different things because um i believe that i mean once you're grateful for something um you've already um acknowledged um that you're um, that you're receiving something and so perhaps then you receive more because you're already in that in in that particular space. But um, I I love that one. I mean, it, when whenever I think um, perhaps unless you're very uh, at, at a different level, quite um, evolved, I, I think at any at any point I can always turn back to the easy one. Like I'm not getting eaten by sharks, and I can grab that. <laughs> Whatever else is going on, it's harder right. to you know when when something uh, more challenging is going on. I think it's harder to grab sort of the um you know i'm so grateful for my life and my you know right. but but it's some of the um the shark fire i'm not i'm not on fire not being eaten by sharks i can i find myself being able to grab those even when when things are pretty challenging anyway so um yeah so i mean if you want to share if you want to share one more I, yeah i think that's great and and i think anger is like fire fire mm -hmm. doesn't stay where you put it it spreads you know mm -hmm. so i'm angry at my boss and i come home and i'm angry at my wife and i'm angry at my dog because it spreads but i think gratitude is contagious to you and sometimes when you're looking for it will spread to the next thing too and mm -hmm. sometimes it has its life of its own if you, if you 
give it permission to grow or just move, you know, it doesn't. And, um, and I don't, we have intellectual ways to kind of weight things. Mm -hmm. And I think being grateful for, uh, I'm not on fire, even though it's absurd, it's just as powerful to the human experience of gratitude as, oh, I'm grateful for my family. I'm grateful for some of these things that, you know, I, I'm trapped in a small house with a, you know, an almost 16 and an 18 year old. And, you know, so basically four adults living in the small place with two dogs and a cat. And sometimes it's hard to find gratitude for that, you, you know, and, but so we don't, so I'm just trying to, caution about saying well i should be grateful for this because this is more meaningful and the body's response and the energetic vibration doesn't really matter okay um the the other one that i would recommend is we we have a whole slew of experiences going on right now um and I think myself and perhaps a, a good chunk of the population may not be fully aware of our experience and our emotions in real time experience. And so one of the things that I often will recommend would be a dear God letter. Now, again, you know, it doesn't have to be dear God, it can be dear universe, dear divinity, dear whatever flavor you want. Um, if you, even if you're um, particularly uh, atheist, you can just do uh, dear physics, dear reality, whatever, it doesn't matter. But because what we want is an opportunity to emotionally vomit somewhere to something, all right? Um, and and so you do Dear Divinity, and you start, start writing. Um, and usually to me, because my divinity tends to be tough, so I can swear at it. I, I say, Dear Divinity, I can't believe you let this happen. You are totally incompetent, blah, 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 whatever. And I just start emotionally vomiting onto the page. And eventually, whatever I put in the junk drawer that I can't see or whatever emotion I have, is going to kind of pop forth, mm -hmm. almost accidentally, kind of carried away and everything and get deposited on that page. And then my, my recommendation would be to burn the Dear God letter uh, for two reasons. One, the smoke rising up, you can say the universe is taking care of your problems. Again, that's a little bit harder for atheists, but they're like the second reason better, I suppose. And that's going to be, that you haven't expressed this, this reason for, or this experience or this thought for, for a whole slew of reasons. Maybe when you were little, you told you your opinion doesn't matter, maybe blah, blah, blah. But, but when you, I want the experience to be expressed. And if I just journal it, someone might, I know someone might come back later and read my journal. So I may not express it. So I have to get rid of the evidence. So burning it gets rid of the evidence. And now I am free to totally vomit without any audience. And I think that frees people up to express even freer what it is. And hopefully a whole bunch of stuff comes out in the wash in that process. And I think that's, a, that's a, a process to again increase awareness in areas that we don't have uh, we have blind spots. I agree. I, I've d I've done that. I haven't done it recently, and it's reminding me that I could benefit from that. <laughs> I should do it. Right. Right. But and I and I like what you said about I I never resonated with the whole journaling thing before, and then perhaps there is this idea that what you know, the things that you haven't expressed, there is a particular reason why you haven't expressed those things. And, uh, and perhaps you're not comfortable putting them into a, into a, into a journal, but, uh, yeah, uh, burning it. That's great. I've, I think I've, I've done that before. And, um, 
that's been a useful exercise. I'm going to revisit that. Um, that was a good one. Um, we can we can zoom out and and uh, and and move on to a different topic unless you you want to add anything to to this. Well, I just just be aware that all we're going to call them religion for lack of a better word hmm. or all spiritual practices um have had to deal with this this is this is a human condition some would even argue these religions were created for this hmm. uh, human condition of powerlessness um so my for some of those who uh I would encourage you to find um, something that resonates with you, whether it be Native American or Eastern or mystical or uh, or Christian or Buddhist. Um, it doesn't necessarily, all of these groups have had to deal with being human. And so find something that is going to work for you um, and just, and don't just say, oh, I have, uh, you know, a negative experience with this particular religion. I don't, I'm not interested in any of it anymore. It's because that's just one flavor, you know. We don't like, um, we don't like Indian food. That's fine. Go get some, uh, you know, some Mexican food. Ain't no big deal. Uh, but find something that, that eats and nourishes you. Well, that doesn't eat you, but you can. <laughs> <laughs> it does no issue. Yeah, uh, that's that, that, that's interesting. That, that's power, that's a powerful thought. The um, the idea that yeah, religions came about to to deal with senses of powerlessness as, as a general thing, and 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 there have been so many events throughout our human history, perhaps that have um, you know perhaps highlighted the need for for a, a, a sort of collective story like that. Um, and perhaps pandemics have been uh, one of those things. I mean, it could have been slavery, it could have been any number of things that created a sense of powerlessness, right? But- uh, Oh, I mean, just loss of a child. Yeah. yeah. You know, I mean, any anything that's devastatingly- uh, Yeah, but I mean, when it occurs at a, at a societal level, that perhaps, uh, gives rise to the need for a collective story like like a religion um oh, I, yeah, a I, collective I, sense of a story in the sense of trying to make se uh, sense and purpose of 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 a collective suffering a collective well yeah i i think i i think that suffering is intrinsic and in human experience so we don't need pan academic all we need to do is just walk out of our door <laughs> and just, yes, probably it's right. i i I have the capacity to create so much suffering <laughs> just by going to the grocery store on any given day that I don't even need a pan epidemic to create need for this, right? Right, right. I, this, I this, think that's, that, that's the, the mystery of being human, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, society's just going about their normal functioning, individuals creating suffering and the need for us to, to make sense right. of that powerlessness and have tools to deal with it. And I think, like you said, you know, whether it's prayer or uh, these different strategies to be able to to vet, process, make sense, and if, and then you have different di different spiritual traditions uh, that might use breath and and or dance, you know, right. more physical things to try to transmute. Um, right, and, and again, you know, going back to picking a spiritual flavor that's that's nourishing to you is you we all have different levels of intelligence um you know if you have a more physical intelligence you have a history of being an athlete you might resonate with some of more of these more physical spiritual practices uh tai chi yoga um even even the west they, ha they have walking the labyrinth so there there are physical ones um, I tend to be more intellectual, so I have a more of an intellectual mystical process. Um, so, so part of it is, is is finding the flavor that nourishes you is also a, a means of self discovery, and and finding that nourishment that that nourishes you is 
is, is the key because uh, what works for me may not work for you.